Hey everyone, I'm Luke and welcome to another episode of Exploring Kodawari. Finally, I should say. It's been over two months since our last episode, so apologies for the delay there. We just got back home from a lot of traveling. We drove up to New York from Florida, then flew to Turkey for over a month, and then finally got back to Florida this week. And even though we had some plans to get a few episodes out during these travels, it just didn't happen. And on top of all of this traveling, my co-host Yanka and I are also getting married at the end of the summer. So if our output is a little inconsistent for the remainder of the summer, that's why. Anyways, this episode is all about the philosophy of Stoicism. Stoicism is over 2,000 years old and was popular in both ancient Greece and Rome. And it's undergoing a revival in recent years for some reasons that we talk about in the episode. Stoicism is what you would call a philosophy of life. It's a way of organizing your life around grand values and grand goals, as well as methods for attaining those goals. Without any philosophy of life, you risk misliving and wandering. What the Stoic author William Irvine, he wrote a book called A Guide to the Good Life, about Stoicism, he calls that wandering enlightened hedonism. Anyways, unlike what a lot of people seem to think, Stoicism is actually not being lowercase s stoical. So if you are coming in with that assumption, don't let that turn you off. Stoicism is actually more similar to Zen Buddhism in that it emphasizes uprooting desire, accepting reality and nature as is, and emphasizing tranquility. So in this episode, which is part one, we talk about the Stoic beliefs and concepts that underlie the philosophy of Stoicism and how they can help you live a better life. And in part two, coming out a few days after this, we go into the specific Stoic techniques. They have very simple and short techniques that you can practice to help you achieve these states of mind. We go into those techniques in detail. They help you achieve gratitude, joy, and tranquility in life. If you already have a background understanding of Stoicism, you might skip directly to part two. But anyways, thanks for listening and enjoy this episode on Stoicism as a philosophy of life. Okay, it's going Hello. again. <laughs> so basically, we recorded this episode last night, and I went to edit it this morning, and the entire thing was like... It was possessed by demons. <laughs> it sounded like a demon possession. My guess is some kind of electrical wire was crossing over one of the microphone wires. Uh, since we were traveling, we're using these clip-on mics that go directly into my iPhone. Um, so if our audio quality sounds a little bit different for this episode, that's what's going on, but... Yeah, there was no, no fixing it. There was no amount of post-production that could have <laughs> fixed it. So we're going to pretend like we didn't Except talk last happened. night yes. and talk again about the philosophy of life called stoicism. Great. And if it comes out a little bit awkward, it's because we literally just had this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> All right, so let's dive in. I feel like this is like the depressed version of the stoicism one. Yeah, I would say so. Or a little bit. It feels like the Groundhog Day. <laughs> you know, we're just yeah. doing it again. See, we should have gotten blacked out drunk and then we wouldn't have remembered what we said. Yeah. Or, or should, should we do I that now? Too well. I, nah. I don't know if we're going to be able to catch up. I'm hitting, actually, I'm hitting record on a backup thing over here just in case. Um, I don't, I don't think. We can catch up in time and get blacked out drunk enough to do this. So let's yeah. try it. Here we go. Okay. So have you heard of stoicism before? <laughs> this sounds so stupid. We just did that. Oh, what is stoicism? <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to adjust my, my questions that I wrote in my notes to you since I just asked them. <laughs> um, I think most people have heard of stoicism. I would say so. They certainly have probably heard the word stoic or stoical. Is stoical a word? Yeah. Like lowercase s to be stoic right? To be a stoic is to be, you know, strong and immune to emotion and, and not show emotion, yeah, right? There was that misconception we talked about yesterday. I remember like I learned it in philosophy class in college and then that was like my take on it. I don't know how it was represented to me, but it was more like I was thinking it's like cold, whatever. Cold, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and to be clear, I think the word, the modern word stoic um, has roots that trace back to stoicism. The The word stoicism itself comes from the, I think the Greek word is stoa, mm -hmm. which means porch. It was like the porch in Ath Athens where the founder of stoicism, Zeno of Sidium, was giving his lectures. Mm -hmm. um, so it started in ancient Greece. It's like a Hellenistic philosophy, something like 300 BC. Mm -hmm. 
from there, it kind of passed down different through different students of, of Zeno. Chrysippus was one. Um, other Greek kind of names that are in my mind that I don't even want to attempt to say. <laughs> but so. eventually it found its way to Rome. Yeah. Like a lot of philosophies. Mm-hmm. And Rome sort of took on a different flavor. of in, in Rome, it took on a different flavor. So Roman Stoicism is probably the more well-known version of Stoicism that people have probably heard through pop culture references like mm-hmm. Marcus Aurelius quotes or Seneca quotes. Yeah. They really integrated into their lifestyle, you would yeah. say? Or, I would say that they, they made it more um, practical and like a way of life. Gregory Hayes, who translated, who, who wrote the translation for the version of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations that I read, he said that Stoicism for upper class Romans became their religion. Mm-hmm. Remember, this is before even Christianity, right? Yeah. Or rather, Christianity was some weird cult that that wasn't like a worldwide religion like it was, right? True, yeah. So, yeah, I think in ancient Greece, Stoicism was like, Many of the ancient philosophies, they attempted to make this all-encompassing philosophy of life, something that made sense of the world and how you should act in it. Mm-hmm. So the Greek Stoics talked a lot about logic and physics and, and understanding the world and matter and, and how our senses take in data and all of this. And it's not like Roman Stoicism ignored that, but it was a little bit more practical and just stuck more with like how you should live your life right? Mm -hmm. So in the intro to meditations, Gregory Hayes writes this little paragraph, which I think is a perfect summary of uh, why you need a philosophy of life. And um, he says, these are the problems that stoicism was trying to solve. Quote, the questions that meditation meditations tries to answer are primarily metaphysical and ethical ones. Why are we here? How should we live our lives? How can we ensure that what we do is right? How can we protect ourselves against the stresses and pressures of daily life? How should we deal with the pain and misfortune? How can we live with the knowledge that someday we will no longer exist? Especially that last one, I would say, is what every philosophy of life, and including religions, that's the... The the, ultimate question. The ultimate. I would say so, yeah. And the Stoics had a very great, answer to that which was like of course just follow your path in life wherever including death yeah um it was it's very similar to buddhism in the sense that over and over the stoic writers talk about change everything is changing Mm -hmm. if it doesn't hurt a rock to change into a different rock over time it shouldn't hurt you right yeah so again it's not the stoic lowercase s stoic in the modern sense of just ignoring pain and and being immune to it. It's more going into your psychology and realizing how else could it be? Everything is always changing, including you, which means you die someday, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's misconstrued as like ignore the emotion of challenging emotion of that, that you're going to die or that everyone you know is going to die or other tragedies in life. But it's more like, just think about it. Yeah, that's like... <laughs> think through it. Yeah. And what else, what other conclusion could you come to? That's right? true. Yeah. Um, so just a little general um, defining of a philosophy of life. How would you define a philosophy of life? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this should be biggest... an easier question that, that since uh, you just answered it last I'm night. having the biggest deja vu. I gave an example of Loki, and I'm going to do that again. <laughs> I actually don't remember your Loki example. Are you serious? Okay. So I was saying, Loki kept saying, um, we we're watching a lot of Disney+. Plus. Loki kept saying his glorious purpose, like, and he was mm. like in search of the glorious purpose. And then it's basically... To be basically, clear, you're saying... You're not saying your philosophy of life is the same as Loki's glorious purpose. No, not mine. <laughs> I'm just saying a general philosophy of life is like one of them, at least. Like maybe there are other branches of it, but main one is like finding your glorious purpose, quote yeah, unquote, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Finding like a goal, a mission, something. I would agree with that. Yeah. I, I think a big part of a philosophy of life is having 
um, a grand goal of living. That's what the um, uh, William Irvine wrote a book sort of like summarizing Stoicism and exporting it into more modern terms so that some ordinary person like me in the 21st century can more easily import Stoicism into my life. He wrote it just for me. Um, <laughs> so he, he talks about a grand goal of living being the goal that you you would never sacrifice for some other goal. Mm -hmm. So it's fine to have multiple goals in life, right? Yeah. Short term, long term, medium term, whatever. But when two goals compete, when two goals are are arguing against each other, which, which one are you going to pick, right? Yeah. Awesome. So the grand goal is the one that is never sacrificed for accomplishing another goal, right? So obviously you want to be very careful about setting such a grand goal. If you set one like Loki does, you'll end up murdering a bunch of people, yeah, right? I would say so. <laughs> um, also having a grand goal, it's not quite the same as saying, what do you want in life? Like I want a house, I want a family, I want... It's asking something deeper, like what do you want how do you this. want to yeah. live your life? Yeah. It's not saying what do you want, want to like, extract. You want a car or like, yeah. it's not like that. I think it's sure. more how do you want to live, not what do you want out of your living, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and he says this nice quote about why people tend to not have a grand goal in living or not even really think about it. Mm -hmm. He says, quote, our culture doesn't encourage people to think about such things. Indeed, it provides them with an endless stream of distractions so they won't ever have to. But a grand goal in living is the first component of a philosophy of life. This means that if you lack a grand goal in living, you lack a coherent philosophy of life. Yeah. So, distraction. This was written before social media. Oh yeah, we were talking about this, remembered. Yeah, um, so social media only makes that, and smartphones in general and all of that, only makes it easier to just... Every time your brain might go into that default mode network and be like, who am I? Where am I in space and time? Where am I going? What is it all? You're just like, nah, Facebook. Yeah. And imagine it's so new in our lives. I don't want to like divert the topic, but it's just so scary. This has been like this for like five years or so. I feel like, like it's if, so new. Yeah. I think it's destroying democracies around the world. It's, it's destroying our ability health. to have shared narratives and make sense. Or destroying our ability to even sit down and just exist. We can't. Yeah. Which is just so dangerous. I love when I, I forget like... my phone and then, you know, you're waiting for your coffee and yeah. you order a coffee and then you go around and wait for it. And your instinct is to grab your rectangle out of your pocket and yep. just stare at it. And then you're like, oh, I didn't bring it. And then you go, I guess I'll just stand here. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually quite nice. Right? It is. It is. It is. For sure. Um, I'm trying to. Anyway, we don't have to. So we'll, we'll <laughs> save. We'll, we'll, maybe we'll do a we'll social media. We'll do a whole media. episode about that. I have so much to say about yeah. that. But anyway. Um, yeah, so besides having a hierarchy of goals and setting a grand goal, mm -hmm. I also like thinking of a philosophy of life as sort of like the scaffolding, scaffolding for how you're going to interpret like the big questions in life. So Marcus Aurelius in his meditation says, doctors keep their scalpels and other instruments handy for emergencies. Keep your philosophy ready too, ready to understand heaven and earth. In everything you do, even the smallest thing, remember the chain that links them. Nothing earthly succeeds by ignoring heaven, nothing heavenly by ignoring the earth. So it's sort of saying, like, keep your philosophy, including that zoomed out perspective on what it all means, ready at all times, especially for emergencies, yeah. like when a tragic event Yeah, that's strikes exactly you, right? when you need it the most. Like, exactly, it's easy to yeah. just say all that, and then when it actually hits, Yeah. I think we ended the second part with a little bit of this, but... Yeah, how you need to yeah. be tested, <laughs> exactly. right? It's one thing to have your philosophy. It's another thing to actually be tested and yeah. see if you follow through on it, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so besides having a grand goal in life, a good philosophy of life also has a strategy for accomplishing that grand goal, right? Mm -hmm. And generally, um, what's his name? William Irvine opens his book by talking about what it means to have a philosophy of life, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, philosophers weren't like academic university department philosophers are today, where they sort of talk in the abstract, detached way. It's not clear that a university philosopher will, will actually be living what he's preaching, right? Yeah. But these ancient philosophers came up with these philosophies of life and then 
open schools to teach students, right?、Mm-hmm. So he says if you don't have a philosophy of life, you, it's not that you're just a terrible person or something, but you're going to live with more regret. You'll mislive, right?、Mm-hmm. And he says you'll probably default to what he calls enlightened hedonism. Hedonism is just like seeking out the short term pleasure. Pleasures,、yeah. Enlightened hedonism is like a slightly better version of that. You're, you're thinking ahead, you're planning ahead, you're not having ice cream every night, but more <laughs> or less you're just chasing from one sensory pleasurable experience to the next and then you die. No glorious and, purpose. Yeah, you're not finding <laughs> your organizing principle, right? Yeah. And not, co- not regularly checking in, like, am I. Accomplishing what I've said is the most valuable thing that needs to be accomplished in the short life that we have. Yeah. Anyways, so that's just the reason why you might <clears throat> want to have a philosophy of life in general. Whether Stoicism ends up being it, it doesn't have to be. <clears throat> you can also take pieces from it, right?、Mm-hmm. So、um, I figured let's just give a few sort of pillars of. Of what Stoicism as a philosophy is and what, what are some of the assumptions underneath it.、Mm-hmm. I think a lot of what Stoicism is, is realizing some fundamental assumptions about the universe and then sort of integrating those into your psychology. So if you know something is true, but you sort of lock it off in a room, what, it doesn't do you very good. But if you realize, for example, everything changes and you're going to die, and then you try to integrate that and accept it, I think. That's a much better thing than just never looking at it and being terrified of it. Yeah. So that's the first one, right? Everything changes. Yeah. The Stoics <clears throat> definitely, in, in a very Buddhist like way, admit that everything changes, including us.、Mm-hmm. They also admit in a determinism to the universe. Determinism is this idea that if the universe is made of this matter that's just following the laws of physics. Everything is a chain of cause and effect,、mm-hmm. right? And even though they had no idea about modern science 2000 years ago, they had no idea about、um, you know, quantum mechanics or something like that, or the, all, all of the equations that we have today.、Mm-hmm. I think they did know about atoms, or they had a word for like particles of matter, because、mm-hmm. that word is in Marcus Aurelius a lot. <clears throat> But they believed in this. Um, determinism that they called the logos. That's a really famous religious word. Yeah.、Um, so the logos was, quote, the unwavering conviction that the world is organized in a rational and coherent way. More specifically, it is controlled and directed by an all pervading force that the Stoics designated the term logos, which, by the way, is the base of the word logic、mm-hmm. and、um, anything that ends in. Logi, Bio- like biology, biology psychology,、yeah. anything, right? So, Logos, capital L Logos, was the universal order, this、mm-hmm. sort of grand chain of cause and effect that's、um, making sense of the world and, 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 and all of the order that you see out there. And then, lowercase l Logos was sort of like what makes us separate from animals. It's our ability to reason as human beings.、Mm-hmm. It's how we can think, right? Yeah.、Um, I think the determinism of Stoicism is pretty scientific. It's just saying the world is doing what it's doing, right? Yeah. Like since the beginning of like all, it all, it's been doing what it's doing when you think of it. Like, yeah. I mean, some people might bangs, think I can、stars. concentrate and make something happen in the world. And I think thinking that. Might be good, but if you talk to a physicist at the end of the day, they're going to say things are just happening, right? Yeah. If you had all the information that, you, that exists, for example, you would know exactly every moment what's going to happen in the future. There's no way to calculate it, right? We、mm-hmm. can't even calculate where a hurricane's going to hit land perfectly. We're often very wrong, right? Yeah. The models have. Limited data and limited predictive power.、Mm-hmm. But if you could calculate every single data point infinitely, right, or as close to that as possible, you could know exactly what's going to happen, you know, 10,000 years into the future.、Yeah. This is what determinism is. And one problem of determinism is where's your free will?、Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. right? So the Stoics got around this in the same way. I think it's just healthy psychologically to get around it, which is you don't have free will over what happens to you and all the things in the external world, but you do have free will Turns internally. How you react to yes. certain things on how or how you think about it. By the way, sometime around here in our first recording, you gave like a little disclaimer, if you remember it correctly. A disclaimer about what? You were saying like, oh, I don't like... You know, support any of this one way or another. It's just these are their ideas type oh, of disclaimer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I do support a lot of it and yeah. not all of it. I mean, it's just unclear. But this is this episode, at least, is more like giving a summary of what stoicism is. Mm -hmm. And I guess for the sake of humility, like, I really don't know what I think about free will. Yeah. I used to think we don't have it. But then as of late, maybe the past year or so, I've come to think of it more like um, maybe the definition of free will isn't whether ultimately in a zoomed out physics way do we have it because our brains are made of the same matter that is predictable by the laws of physics, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe the belief that you have free will is free will. Yeah. It's, in other words, it's an emergent thing. Something that you Just like consciousness is, huh, right? Very interesting, okay. From the outside, I can't show you that that you have consciousness, right? Yeah. So if you believe it, it is there. If you name it, it's your subjective experience yeah. of, of yeah. experience, right? Yeah. So maybe free will is just the subjective experience of feeling like as if you have mm -hmm. control over your internal framing of things and your choices and whatnot. So um, the Stoics define free will as a uh, quote, a voluntary accommodation to what is in any case inevitable. So it's sort of like what's going to happen to you is inevitable. It's, it's was always going to happen. Your free will is whether you voluntarily accept this or not. <laughs> or it's going to happen regardless. Yeah. It totally is. Yeah. I and, and this guy, Gregory Hayes, um, in writing the intro for Marcus Aurelius gave this example. According to this theory, man is like a dog tied to a moving wagon. If the dog refuses to run along with the wagon, he will be dragged by it. Yet the choice remains his, to run or be dragged. In the same way, humans are responsible for their choices and actions, even though these have been anticipated by the Logos and form part of its plan. Even actions which appear to be, and indeed are, immoral or unjust advance the overall design, which taken as a whole is harmonious and good. They too are governed by the Logos. So there's, in this last part there, was the second big assumption of uh, underlying Stoicism, which is that the Logos exists and it's good, right? Yeah. So you have to sort of believe that even when tragedies are, are happening to you, it's part of the harm, harmonious it's goodness good. to the Logos, right? Okay. Huh. Yeah. It's a little bit hard to see it like that. But in for a lot the of moment, probably, right? yeah. but for a That's stoic, the whole they point prepared of their whole life for that. It's true, yeah. Um, and again, it's sort of like realizing that everything changes, including you, and you're going to die. It's like easy to say, harder to integrate into the 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 far reaching corners of your brain, right? Yeah, and your subconscious and whatnot. So, yeah, those are the main assumptions underneath stoicism. So, what is it like as a definition? It's not a way to get happiness. It's also not a, a way to, you know, be strong necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. um, more zoomed out, stoicism is trying to um, teach you to reframe your experience of the world in a better way. Mm -hmm. um, if that involves being stoical sometimes, that's fine, but it's not that stoicism's goal is being stoical as you might think by the name, right? Yeah. It's not um, pretending you don't have emotions or rejecting them or ignoring them. It's more reframing them and practicing specific techniques so that negative emotions don't come up as often. Mm -hmm. So it's teaching you to let go of negative emotions, to figure out why they come up and have them not come up as much. Mm -hmm. And for a Stoic, they thought that happiness and joy wasn't something you then got out there in the world, but that if you follow these stoic techniques and avoid the causes of negative emotions, That's what joy emerges. and happiness follow. Yeah, 
I see. You don't try to actively make yourself happy, but right. if you avoid it, the other one's going to emerge. Yes. Okay. That, that, you know, it's about doing less, right? Yeah. And that's also a very Buddhist thing, right? So the mm-hmm. Stoics were very mindful about knowing um, your desires and realizing that as soon as you get something, then you desire more, right? This um, dukkha is the word in Buddhism, right? It means suffering, but it really means, I think, unsatisfactoriness. Mm -hmm. It means everything is unsatisfying as soon as you get something you want more. So the Stoics had techniques to teach you to desire what you already have, for example, through fun techniques like negative visualization, right? Yeah, that we talked about. Um, Hard. I wrote here, and I think this is one of the best zoomed out definitions of stoicism if you had to give like a a short phrase to define it Mm -hmm. stoicism is the difference between viewing things that happen to you as a blessing or as a curse right between seeing yourself as a victim or as a strong logos right a Mm -hmm. center of truth and logic who can work through the problem who can frame it in a way that lets you move forward right Obstacles on your path are the path. Yeah. Talked about it a lot, I remember. So can you say something to what you've seen, maybe especially coming from a different culture? You came here like six, seven years ago about the way like the opposite of that seems to be pervasive in society, like seeing things happening to you as curses, as you being the victim of something, that kind of mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, I mean, I don't know if it's a new thing in this culture because I haven't experienced any of the culture six like six years before this. But there's a lot of victim mentality going on. I feel like here people are just always thinking like things are happening to them and therefore reacting a certain way. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know, like maybe culturally we would do that like for a while, but always you always are like get up okay what's the plan now like what am do i that going for to a next? few days and then yeah move exactly on then move thing. on kind of thing and here like i think maybe a little bit too much people just want like special accommodation for their thing yeah. with, without like actually finding it might even feel things. good for a very brief time for someone to treat you like a victim yeah. which is why maybe part of you wants to right but it it's not a long-term strategy for any kind of well-being or happiness or something like that, yeah, right? I don't think so. Um, I think it's also along the same kind of logic as like someone else is responsible for your happiness. Like it's thinking like the world is harming me in all these ways and the world should be making me more happy or something, right? Yeah. And stoicism is like, what? No, you're only from your real world. freedom is your own psychology yeah. and how you frame the world yeah right um how you yeah, accept reality right it's all about realizing the logos right the the determinism of the universe is just happening and the only free will you have is to accept that or not yeah. right it's very different than like well, how society has been living lately i feel like Especially, yeah, especially when it comes to victims and and this idea of um, happiness. Irvine, towards the end of his book, was writing about this victim culture because he he, he said in an interview I heard that he thinks stoicism has, it's it's been like really on the rise. Like I think the number of books that have been published on stoicism is just skyrocketing right now in the past 10, 12 years, which is right in line with this sort of victim culture becoming very popular. People need something to counter, counter that. that. Yeah, I they guess. want wants another another solution, right? Yeah. So he says so, towards the end of his book, quote, many of us have been persuaded that happiness is something that someone else, a therapist or a politician, must confer on us. Stoicism rejects this notion. It teaches us that we are very much responsible for our happiness as well as our unhappiness. It also teaches us that it is only when we assume responsibility for our happiness that we will have a reasonable chance of gaining it. This, to be sure, is a message that many people, having been indoctrinated by therapists and politicians, don't want to hear. 
Huh. So, because yeah. he, he, he wrote a whole chapter about how, how when you go to therapy, it's very common for, for, for a person to tell the therapist all of the bad things that have happened to them, right? Yeah. And I think what might be missing from a lot of that, as good as that is, because you don't want to suppress things, right? Yeah. And you, you want help to, to work through them in a safe way and all of that. But you also need help to reframe those not in a way where you're a victim, but then to move yeah. past them and realize that you can own that. Yeah. That's you're a strong logos. You're not a victim of life. Yeah. Right. And that's a very like huge difference in between a good therapist and like a not so good one. I Probably, feel like yeah. is yeah. good one is the one that's helping you doing that framing. Right. And, oh, and the other ones, the other ones might like, think they're helping shame. you too. Like, right. Someone yeah. who's making you a victim might think they're helping you because they think that's the compassionate thing to do. That's what it means to have sympathy and, and what whatnot. I would say so, yeah. But I'm not saying there are evil therapists oh, oh, out there. Obviously, yeah. that's why I try to say but I would not say, so good. Like not I would say the much more compassionate thing is is to make someone stronger, not make them weaker. I agree. Right? I agree. Um yeah. so that's just a general comment, I think, on why stoicism is so popular right now. Um, yeah, getting back to like what the goal of it is, stoicism, talking about a philosophy of life, having a grand goal, the grand goal of stoicism is, uh, the Greek word adoraxia or tranquility, mm -hmm. right? Here we are again. <laughs> <laughs> Every last time when we talked about tranquility, I was like, oh, uh, is there a word for it in Turkish? And then you were like, I, I was like saying you were like do you think i thought for a turkish while? people need the word tranquility <laughs> yeah but then also found out like i mean came up with one and then realized how rarely we use that word which yeah. is not a surprise but anyway um they have sijak uh, khan yeah <laughs> they have warm have blood warm hot blood, blood. <laughs> yep. um yes so the grand goal for stoicism i think the greeks would say it was virtue and it's kind of related to tranquility, but in Roman Stoicism, virtue was talked about much less and tranquility was the, the thing mentioned the most. So not only did they have this grand goal of tranquility, the Stoics also had specific techniques aimed at achieving tranquility, things aimed at desiring what you already have so you don't desire more external things, right? Yeah. Th things aimed at viewing your life and reframing things so that you appreciate where you are, reframing challenges that happen to you so that you aren't a victim, mm -hmm. realizing things happen for you, not to you, right? Yes. Blessings, not curses. So they had a lot of specific techniques. That's what um, we go over in part two of this mm -hmm. episode. So first off, let's just talk about tranquility for a second. Can you try to define it in English? Like, what do you think tranquility means? Like maybe calmness state of like i don't want to say peacefulness but i'm I running say out of peacefulness maybe maybe yeah i mean it's its own word so saying it's another word will miss something yeah, right exactly i think it's it's a pretty subtle word but to be clear it does not mean it, it, tranquility doesn't have the same meaning as the other related word like tranquilizer or tranquilized, right? Yeah, it's very different, obviously. It doesn't mean like zombie-like state of nothingness and no emotions or something, right? Yeah, it's like a peaceful acceptance, I would say. Yeah, maybe. for me, it's about like the once a week feeling you get when your chest opens up while you're on a walk <laughs> or you're meditating. And it closes back in. And then you're like, ah! Oh, like, no, let me have this. <laughs> Uh, you know that bundle of nerves in your chest? I think it's called the solar plexus, right? Mm -hmm. It's what's really tight when you're anxious and it can make you feel like, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack and it's just a panic attack or something or just low level anxiety or whatever. But I think um, tranquility really hits you when that bundle of nerves opens up and you feel your chest open up and it's just like, and and it's just like this wave of seeing the world very clearly <clears throat> and accepting reality, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of like the clouds clear and you see very, um, I guess the word would be vipassana, right? Yeah. That you you see you have the insight into the true nature of the world and you're not deluded by 
all these thoughts and desires and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very related to Buddhism, I think. And I think tranquility is also the goal in Buddhism, right? That's true. I would say so. The cool part about stoicism is you don't have to like meditate every day and go to a cave to achieve it. You just have to do these thought experiments yeah, once in a just while. Think differently. Yeah, exactly. On the spot. Um, so I think tranquility is more like uh, finding a place in your mind and a frame in your mind that can contain the entire range of emotional experiences, right? It's just a way to contain all of life and seeing the logos and the cause and effect that links it all, right? It's mm -hmm. seeing that challenges that happen to you and obstacles are the path. That yeah. is what life is. Life is not a path that unfortunately has obstacles. The obstacles are the path. That's yes. what life is, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think tranquility is the peaceful acceptance of that, something like that. Yeah, very nice. Um, Marcus Aurelius talked about tranquility as a kind of harmony with nature and with yourself. I think that's a big part of tranquility too, is the same way you have to accept the logos of the world out there. You also have to accept, you know, the internal environment of your own psychology, right? Yeah. Um, Marcus Aurelius said, nowhere you can go is more peaceful than within. I like it. Exactly at this moment, I thought to myself... All of these schools, like religions, overlap a lot. I was just thinking like Sufism or something. Oh, yeah. Or like, yeah. I don't know. A lot of stuff probably in, again, Buddhism, as we said, but Bible and stuff. Probably. And a lot of, I think a lot of the religions are all operating on the same um, hardware and software of our brain. We're just putting different labels on yeah. it. So. And what I, what I was trying to say is like, it's very cool to see human beings come to similar conclusions. Uh, yeah. yeah. With different language. Or and different, different frameworks, frameworks, right? Frameworks, yeah. I could, I could think, oh, a moment of tranquility has just visited me if I'm a Stoic. If I'm a yeah. Christian, I could think the Holy Spirit just touched me, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I'm um, a Buddhist, I might think, you know, I just had a taste of enlightenment for a second, right? Yeah. You know, all these different labels, I think, are uh, gesturing at the same thing that you're because we're all humans we have the same basic psychology we even have the same basic psychology that marcus aurelius had yeah. two thousand years ago right yeah very true. um marcus also marcus like he's my, marcus my dude marcus yeah. <laughs> my boy marcus also said if you seek tranquility do less which that's cool people don't do it less enough <laughs> yeah for <laughs> Wait, sure they, they do too much i would say so um he says because most of what we say and do is not essential <laughs> if you can eliminate it you'll have more time and more tranquility ask yourself at every moment <laughs> is this necessary oh this is my favorite quote so far i love it just for people talking and being annoying and it's all that. existing sometimes <laughs> anyway um so the last thing uh for this episode just to give a, a sort of framework of how Stoicism can be a philosophy of life. Um, a big pillar of, of conceptual like framework is what's called the dichotomy of control. Um, Epictetus, who was one of the uh, three most famous Roman Stoics, along with Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. There was also another guy named M M Musonius Rufus, I think. Great. I found a really cool quote of his. I forget where I wrote it down. Um, but the poor guy gets left out of like almost every stoic conversation. So shout out to Rufus. <laughs> Rufus, we love you. <laughs> so sad that he didn't make it. Um, maybe I'll put one of his quotes in the episode notes just to give him a shout out. Um, so Epictetus famously opened up his, uh, by the way, not a, not a, uh, a lot of these writings survived. I think more Roman writings survived than Greek writings, right? Okay. Um, but anyways, Epictetus opened his main notebook or whatever it was called, treatise, I don't know. Um, quote, some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. Very simple. Now, I don't know the original language and translations can get weird. And so this obviously can sound like a false dichotomy, right? Yeah. It what does. about all the in-between stuff, right? Yeah, th that's true. So uh, this author, and I think he's some he teaches somewhere in Ohio, I believe, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, William Irvine, he, in his book, uh, A Guide to the Good Life, he changes the dichotomy of control to the trichotomy of control, mm -hmm. things we have no control over, 
things we have all control over and things we have some, some control over, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and he says, besides having complete control over our goals and values, Marcus points out that we have complete control over our character. We are, he says, the only ones who can stop ourselves from attaining goodness and integrity. We have it entirely within our power, for example, to prevent viciousness and cupidity from finding a home in our soul. Um, cupidity. Greediness. <clears throat> Greed, yeah. Yes, I remember. <laughs> so it's the same theme that we already talked about with uh, b before, that we can control only the only thing we have complete control over are internal things yeah or yeah. how we react to certain certain events uh, we how we say. ultimately react not maybe what our initial reaction is inside yeah like if a loud noise startles you you can't control that initial reaction but you can control whether you stay scared or, or yeah. think of it a certain way right now, again, in modern psychology, a lot of people would tell you or a neuroscientist would say, we don't have free will. We can't even control how this very sentence is going to come out of my mouth. You're just a, a meat robot who's also <laughs> following the determinism of the universe. So I don't know. Maybe the Stoics are wrong, but I would say that's a, a really interestingly weird way to live life if you don't think you can control things inside of yourself right yeah Pro I, I, I it's just i i think it's not a very good operating system to just live a, a good life and yeah, a philosophy of life is all about making axioms and beliefs and truths in the world that so that you can live a good life right yeah so you have complete control over internal things like your character like keeping your soul clean right having integrity you have some control over some external events. Like if you're playing a tennis match, you have some control over whether you win or not, right? Yeah. Yeah. You have no control over whether the, the sun comes up or not, or whether, true. you know, some war breaks out somewhere or something, right? You, you have limited control depending on the external thing. But the point is you always have more control over internal things, right? True, true. Um, this is similar to the Christian serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept oh, the things okay. I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Right? Or Jeff apartment wall. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> when we moved into our old apartment. It was <laughs> up on the wall. Um, and you you were like, oh, get that shit off. I'm like, no, no you should really it read it. It was written in script. I'm allergic to script. And you didn't even read it, though. Uh, it was written in script. It I don't did care. look ugly. But yeah, I'm allergic to script. I don't care what it's it also one of those cliche things. Like people say that all the yeah. time. And, and I'm like, yeah, really live deep. your life like yeah. that, bitch. <laughs> like, exactly. What are you doing? Like they're doing live, laugh and whatever. What was the other one? Live, eat, laugh, laugh, eat, pray. Yeah, they do all of that successfully, <laughs> I guess. But it's like, why don't if people <laughs> actually did the things that were written in their houses on the walls and stuff, <laughs> we would be an amazing world. <laughs> I 100% agree on that. That's funny. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gregory Hayes in, in introducing Marcus Aurelius gives the example of your house burning down. So in the dichotomy of control or trichotomy, you don't have control over your house burning down. If you were at work and you come home and the house burned down, right? Mm -hmm. You don't even have control over that initial like fear reaction as you walk up to your house and see that it's burnt down. And, but what you do have control over is ultimately how you choose to frame that event, right? Yeah. How you choose, whether you choose to think a horrible tragedy has befallen me is actually a choice. And it's not obvious that um, seeing it that way is best for you in the long run, right? It's again, this idea of really taking to heart the obstacle is the path, right? The Marcus Aurelius says the impediment impediment to action advances action. The thing in your way is what makes you have a way to go on the way, right? That's true. That's true. It's things happen for me, not to me, right? That's true. We were talking about real care having a calm quote. We still haven't looked up. Ah. Oh yeah. I don't even remember where we said that in the botched version of this. Yeah. Lost like all the 
you know, flow in itself, obviously. So yeah, last night was time. amazing. If you're getting bored in this episode, I just wish you could have heard the amazing, it was the best, as Trump would say. <laughs> People are talking say. about it. Yeah, um, some might say the best. Okay. So this accommodating to nature, Epictetus called this the art of acquiescence, right? Accepting, right? Um, he said, quote, as human beings, we are part of nature and our duty is to accommodate ourselves to its demands and requirements. So it's in a way, it's a sort of surrender. You know what I mean? Yeah. The logos is out there and you can either be the dog being dragged by it or you can run along with it. It's not to say that everyone has the same wagon and the same tied to the wagon in the same way, right? Life yeah. is easier for some, more difficult for others. Sure. But the logos is what the logos is and your life is what was predetermined by this cosmic chain of cause and effect. So whatever your situation is, you have the it's choice to, to either accept it as happening for you, as advancing your path in life, or as happening to you and becoming and be a, a victim. victim. Yeah. Yep. It's like a fundamental fork in the road somewhere deep in your psychology, I guess. Right. I guess so. Yeah. Woo. So in conclusion, <laughs> <laughs> this one feels a little bit more less flowy and more, um, uh, just reading because well, we're doing it for the because, second time. Yeah. So if, <laughs> no again, time. if it feels unnatural, we're sort of making eye contact at each other the whole time. Like, uh, we just had this conversation. <laughs> um, so yeah, stoicism as a philosophy of life, it, it's just one operating system. It's like, sort of like you can have Mac or Linux or windows, right? Mm -hmm. It's one operating system to have a philosophy of life. Otherwise, if you don't have any philosophy of life, you'll probably have an aimless and, you know, enlightened hedonism approach to life. Mm -hmm. So I think you can build your own personal philosophy of life. You can like, um, what did I say last night? Dine a la carte on philosophies and religions. You don't have to just sign up for one. Yeah. You know, when you're at a restaurant and you're like, I don't know if I should get the salmon. I really want the steak. Like, oh, that chicken looks good. But if it's a buffet, you can just get a little bit of everything. I think that's a very I think that's healthy how way of approaching real life buffets anyway. So. Yeah, that's a great way to be like, all right, this religion has this great thing. I want to take this beautiful idea of self-sacrifice from Christianity, but leave out the weird, like, you know, Old Testament stuff. I want to take this beautiful stuff from Buddhism, but leave out the reincarnation stuff. Like you can, you can dine a la carte on these philosophies and then kind of try to build your own consistent one, right? Highly recommended for politics as well, which people yeah, are lacking. Yeah, same thing. People yeah. tend to go all in. It's like, if you know my position on one political thing, you would assume to be able to know my position on all these other things, even though they're really unrelated. Yeah. Very, like, very why would knowing happens. my position on gun control tell you what I think about abortion or um, welfare or tax, you know, brackets or how that should work, right? Um, I, I also prefer to dine a la carte on politics, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, I would say um, you can check out the article I wrote. It'll be linked in the episode notes. It's sort of this, but just a little bit more flushed out. Mm -hmm. It's more the Romanized version of Stoicism, which also has these spiritual exercises and, and um, techniques that you can practice to try to absorb Stoicism into your into your psychology. Um. It's also like I love about how Marcus writes and I've read him the most, but stoicism is very um, selfless. It's saying all, all, all the time, like how um, our nature is unselfish and we're here to serve other people, right? Yeah. To accommodate ourselves to nature so that we can be our best version of who we are in society, right? Yeah. They encourage participation in society. It's not like you go figure all this stuff out and go live in a cave and become a monk or something, yeah, right? that's the biggest distinction from hedonism for sure. Yeah, you. yeah. Sort out your mind so that you can best participate in society kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, and I'll, if everybody does this, they're happy and then they're making well, each other happy. They're tranquil, so. right? Tranquil, they, they have tranquility. Yes. Happiness will probably visit them very yeah, often. Yeah, very often. Right? Happy was, yeah, and that's true. Imagine how different the world would be if more people were actively seeking tranquility by by implementing some of these techniques and yeah part two we go over the specific techniques but um i think i'll end this one with a short quote by marcus 
it's like journal entries. His book meditations are like these little spiritual exercises or journal entries that he's writing to himself. Mm -hmm. And at one point he asks himself the question, what is unique to the good man? And he answers it with to welcome with affection, what is sent by fate, not to stain or disturb the spirit within him with a mess of false beliefs. Instead to preserve it faithfully by calmly obeying God. And by the way, he, um, interchange the word logos and God quite often Interesting. saying nothing untrue Oh, and nature. So God logos and nature, nature were sort were of like synonyms. Thing. Yeah. Huh. Um, by calmly obeying God saying nothing untrue, doing nothing unjust. And if the others don't acknowledge it, this life lived with simplicity, humility, cheerfulness, he doesn't resent them for it and isn't deterred from following the road where it leads to the end of life. An end to be approached in purity, in serenity, in acceptance, in peaceful unity with what must be. I love that last ending to the sentence, especially. Yeah. Peaceful unity with what must be. I think that would be the perfect definition of tranquility, right? Yeah, that's true. Very nice. Damn. Stoicism. <laughs> Just specifically Marcus Aurelius, if you're going to do any kind of stoic reading, I recommend... Marcus Aurelius, like give yourself yeah. maybe a little framework of, of the background of Stoicism. And, which and actually so the intro to, to it does that anyways. Yeah. And then it's so easy to integrate and understand the way. There's short wrote. little things like yeah. I just read, like you could read that and then close the book and go, go to work, right? Yeah. Leave the book around your house and just read little things like that every day. It kind of gestures it to you. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Thanks Yanka for doing this again. Okay. And let's hope that no electrical buzzing and demonic possession has ruined this recording. Yes. And it's really uh, hope for that. Definitely. But if it happened, let's stay stoic. Yeah. It's okay. If it happens, that's the <laughs> obstacle is the way. And then, yeah, in part two, we go over the specific techniques for, you know, kind of sorting out some of the stuff in your mind. All right. See ya. Bye. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Exploring Kodawari. If you enjoyed it, we hope you'll consider sharing it on social media and with friends. You can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Those help us more than you would think. And if you'd like to help us out in a more substantial way, consider going over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links are in the episode notes for this. You can do this as a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. All of that support will help us to set aside time in order to create content for the podcast and the blog. And finally please get in touch with us and say hi, either on social media or privately through email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening and see you next time.